Welcome to Eventual Millionaire. I'm Jamie Tardy, and I'm really excited to have my friend Matt Schaup on the show. He owns a multi-million dollar painting company. I've known him for many years. He also runs mattschaup.com. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. I feel it's so funny. We've met each other years and years ago, like when Eventual Millionaire first started. And yep. we've talked so many times, I feel like I've interviewed already and I never have. We haven't officially, but yeah, we have talked a lot. I've watched you come up and you're killing it and it's awesome to see. Oh, I really appreciate that. So why don't you give us the rundown of creating this painting empire? Because the thing is, is that uh, you sort of came from nothing and you've made this amazing business. Yeah, I uh, came from less than, than nothing. And I didn't think that I'd be sitting here. We're celebrating our uh, 10 year anniversary this year, our painting company. And, and, I, and I never thought in a million years I'd be sitting here on a, on a millionaire interview. I think in my in my young age, you know, late teens, early 20s, I've always been the entrepreneurial type. And I said, Oh, that would be cool to be a millionaire. But I never thought I'd do it in a, in a business that's not a very sexy business. Um, you've got a lot of interesting characters in the business, uh, lots of lots of turnover. But I noticed when I when I started my business, I got uh, laid off and fired from a corporate banking job. Uh, we just we we didn't get along. They threw me out. So I was really forced uh, to, to do something. Uh, painted my way through college. Never thought I'd come back to it. I said this is a cool college gig, and I came home one day. I was uh, recently married, um, in in lots of debt, six figures in debt. Uh, that's the less than nothing that I referred to. And um, said, hey, you know, honey, I got fired today and I'm, I'm going to go do this painting thing. And I thought I'd do it for a few months and have it hold me over. And six months in, seven months in, a year later, you know, we, we knocked out, I think, a half million dollars worth of revenue in our first year. Um, and I was doing everything. I was I was managing the first set of people that came in, the sales, the marketing. Uh, Emily was fortunate to be able to, to quit her job uh, come into the office for a little bit. That didn't last long because we we didn't work well together. <laughs> um, she was ready to fire me. She did that about about eighteen months in. So we just slowly. I said, "Wow, we can do this. We can actually do this as a as a business." So I just really started uh, learning more of, about all the aspects of of the business. I, I started doing the things I loved and having other people do the things that I hate that I that I still hate to this day. Um, I actually hate painting. I am a I'm a bad painter like that wall behind you. If I came to paint it, it's it's going to look bad. You're you're not going to hire me. Tell your friends about me. Um, not my strength. So uh, we hired people to do that. And uh, you know, to this day, I think we've done about 18 million worth of revenue in, in a pretty small, about a 300,000 person market here in Northern Colorado. It's not a not a huge place. Um, yeah, and we've really established ourselves and done some done some really fun things. How did you go, though, from going, okay, I lost my job, I'm going to paint? Because painting, I mean, I've hired painters as like solopreneur ones. Mm -hmm. They don't, they don't, no offense, but they don't have the vision of going, oh, I'm going to make a huge painting empire out of no, this. They don't. How did you decide to do that? I, I always l approached the business and looked at the business as, as that I'm an entrepreneur first who is happening to, to paint. Again, I'm, I'm a bad painter. I'm, I'm not exactly. a painter. Yeah, and, and, I, and I don't paint. So, I mean, and that's still how we operate to this day. And and that's what earns us a lot of business is there, there's a lot of great painters in this area in northern Colorado. But, um, you know, did, did they call you back? Were they professional? Did they show up, you know, not not scaring your wife and, and kids and dog away? So I just always approached everything that this is a business and and, we, and the painting is just a product, whether – whether it's painting, we're installing hardwood floors, uh, running a podcast is uh, apply the basic business principles of serving people and taking good care of people. And, and that's that's what grew it. And that's what separated us from everybody else. Well, that's what I was going to ask you about, the because no offense, there probably were a ton of other painters in your market in general. And then you come in and how can you really set, set yourself apart with just doing basic business fundamentals? Yeah. You know what I mean? It, true in in this in this industry at least and in a lot of the trades I don't know how many of, of if you have a lot of listeners uh, that, that are in the trades but it's not it's not hard to do we kind of sit around and joke is that if I if I show up I look professional uh, I, I'm I'm clean and sober no offense but uh, you know half the people that show up are freaking people out and, and and now that I look around at other businesses you know professional more say white white collar businesses uh, business to business oh he didn't show up he didn't call back just the basic do what you say. 
and just do it a little bit better than, than everybody else and lean into what you're good at. Your business will, will explode and, and you can leave other people in the dust. And, it's so uh, funny with this. I mean, yeah. I've worked with plumbing companies, landscaping companies and stuff like that. It is hilarious how little you have to do <laughs> comparatively to everybody else. Yeah. But yeah, you also is. must have had really great marketing skills because it's not just that. You still have to get the clients. You know what I mean? Of course, service them and yes. they'll maybe tell their friends later. But what was, what was the yeah. marketing tactics that worked the best? So, so I laughed because we made, we made a lot of people angry, which, which said a lot. So, so we, we really, our marketing is really polarized people. People either love us and call us or they say crazy things about us. But, um, I went out for about 12 to 18 months and I just pounded on doors. I literally really? said, Hey, we're going to be in the neighborhood. I'm Matt. Here's my card. Call me. Um, got chased by dogs, bit by dogs, uh, thrown, thrown out of houses, out of yards. And then that's all, and that's all fun. But the, <laughs> one of the things... Fun. <laughs> that we did is I, I just saw what everybody else was doing. And I said, you know what, let's just do something else completely crazy, completely out of the box. I saw uh, one of these tax preparation franchise company, they had somebody dressed up like a like the Statue of Liberty shaking a shaking a sign. Yeah. And, and then I saw home builders doing it. And they all kind of weren't great at their jobs. They weren't doing it as best I think as they could. So somebody dared me. They're like, hey, I dare you to throw some some high school kid out on the corner of the busiest corner in town. And I was like, you know, what am I going to lose? I'm going to lose, you know, 30, 40 bucks, pay, pay somebody 10 bucks an hour through a, some, some crazy kid from the dance team at a high school out on the corner. And he just started just rocking it, just putting, putting everybody to shame. And the phone started ringing. My wife, she's still in the office, calls up and says, hey, what's, what's going on? The phone's just blowing up here. Uh, who's this Ben kid? And I said, yeah, I guess, guess that worked. So um, from a marketing standpoint, we, we just try out of the box, crazy things, and then we track it. We see where the business is coming from. And then we keep investing into what works and ditch what, what doesn't work. And I've tried a lot of things like uh, putting your logo on the urinal cakes <laughs> at the bar. Sorry, that was loud. Wow. That, did, that didn't work. Uh, we, we got a lot of phone calls, but they were they were interesting. I saved some of them. Maybe we can like cut some, oh my cut God, some into this hilarious. interview. Yeah, th those don't work very well. Um, so we've just, I just tried everything. I was, I was willing to just throw, throw some time, energy, money out there. But really at the end of the day, what's grown our business is, is just, you know, that's going to get you the lead. But when you get in front of somebody, you've got to give them an experience where find out what you're the best at in, in the business and what the business needs to serve that customer. And then, and then just give it all you've got and, and be willing to share your mistakes. I think from, we did a, a painted baby campaign, uh, about a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. and we actually accidentally painted a, a customer's baby. We had a paint sprayer blow up, uh, got paint all over the house, the concrete, the landscape, and she was out holding her baby. And, um, you know, my competition would kill to know about something that we screwed up so they could go tell everybody not to hire us. So we said, you know what, why don't we just do it first? And uh, we, we painted my daughter, we brought her into the office, we threw paint all over her and then plastered bus benches, uh, bus stops, signs all over town, and, and it kind of caught on. So th oh, those are some of the marketing screw up things. and you used it as a marketing yeah. tactic. Absolutely. What if that blew up in your face? Like what, you know what I mean? What if you were just telling everybody bad things instead of, you know, it being good? How was it good? It, it was good. Well, we, we started doing it. I mean, it was, it's one of those things, like all these buzzwords that you see. I just had a conversation about this yesterday. Uh, we have a new uh, marketing person on our team and she says, here's what all the competition's saying. We, we, we're quality. We have integrity. It's like, duh, you better. You know, like like yeah. you have to, but why, why would you need to use all these buzzwords? Just, just go out and do it. Stop saying it. Start doing it. <laughs> And that's just my approach. So we, you know, I had a customer, he was, he was a real tough sell. I told him all how great we are. I showed him our shiny marketing brochure and he's like, you know, that's, that's great, but this is my $2 million house. And I want to know, you know, I want to know about a time you really screwed something up. And I was like, well, Hey, we painted a lady's baby. And, I, and then I thought, I can't believe I just said that to this guy. And he hired me. He said, you know what, if, if that's the worst thing, you let somebody know the worst thing that could potentially happen and that has happened. Um, a, your competition has no ammunition and, mm. uh, and you're just, and you're just being real, you know, it's like, here's, here's, we painted the wrong house once. I mean, we've done the wrong color a few times. We, we painted the wrong house. Um, but the baby was, was the worst I'd say. <laughs> so, so we knew to answer the question coming back to it is, is we knew it was, it was getting some good attention because we would just start sharing it. The campaign was really born out of, man, I've been sharing this story at every single appointment we go on and, and people are just rolling and they're laughing and they're mm -hmm. signing contracts left and right. And, and, and we're getting away from telling everybody how great we are and said, Hey, here, here's, that, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how great you are. When something screws up, you're going to show 
your character and, and how you handle things when, when something's on the line. So mm, I love though that you tested it a little bit ahead of time instead of just sort of going <laughs> out and that, telling people. Yes. So that is very important. What's the system yeah. that you use for marketing? Cause I feel mm -hmm. when I talk to people in general, and I know you do coaching and stuff like that now, people, mm -hmm. especially in the marketing space, it takes time to test things, you know, analyze them, <laughs> look at the data, see what's working, keep doing more. And then that changes sometimes. So what yeah. systems do you use in order to really track that and make the best decisions marketing wise? Awesome question. I, I've always been a numbers guy and a math guy. So from the very beginning, we've we've evolved into having a pretty cool CRM that we built that tracks where everything comes from. So I'd ask you if you call, you know, where did where did you hear from us? And you know, it went it went from door knocking and sign spinning to to building that client base and then word of mouth. And again, like the urinal cakes, we we crossed that off the list because because those didn't work. We just just listened to these phone calls. Um, but we you know we were using spreadsheets and a way to just track everything. Here's 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 how much pure profit came in from, from this much revenue. And really where we're at now is we get about 45 to 50% of the business from word of mouth, which that wasn't the case at the beginning. Um, and, and it does take time and, and you've got to just, you've got to be willing to try things. Um, one thing I share is when I started, I had a lot more time to invest than, than money. So I was door knocking. I was face to face, uh, was hanging out at the Home Depot, just uh, up and down the paint aisle, pretending to look for something. And then, really? and then just talking to somebody, Hey, you know, let me, this is, you should get this paint, not that paint. And Oh, by the way, do you have a painter? So those things worked. And then I was running out of time, but we had more financial resources. And I think that's the case in, in, in a lot of, you know, grassroots and, and startups is you, you just got to go and you got to just bang and hit the street. And, uh, you might be kind of tight on the money, but then when you get some, don't be afraid to to try a little here, try a little there um, and track it. So we'll talk about this because we were talking about this a little bit beforehand with with leverage, because you're right at the beginning. It's like you're working all hours. You're trying to figure out what works. You're being the guy knock it. And everybody's like, I don't yeah. want to do this, especially online. They're like, I don't want to call people on the phone no. or I don't yeah. want to do the stuff that sounds difficult or hard. But give me the evolution of like how you went from knocking on people's doors and having people kick you out to actually having some leverage. Yeah, I think it was after it was about midway through the second year. So about midway mm -hmm. through 2006, I, I was still knocking on doors. And then I said, cool, I'm going to drop 10 bucks an hour for, for Ben, the dancer on the corner. And then I started doing that and, and that worked. So then I hired his friend, Corey, and then his friend, Matt. Uh, then I started doing some direct mail. Fo phone book was was still it was starting to die out. So I did a little bit of that, but it was, it was about 18, 18, maybe 24 months into the business. I was able to, uh, I was just busy. I couldn't do everything anymore. I needed to start hiring, uh, mid-level managers, um, pay, you know, for some of the marketing and, and then just tested it. So, I mean, that, that's what happened for me. And I just, and that's just when I started tracking and testing things. Well, so when did you, what was your first like couple hires? Of course you had painters at first, but like who was that yeah. main uh, person? Do you have a customer service? What was the evolution of you mm -hmm. and how many employees do you have now too? Yeah, right Right now we have between 75 and, and 90, depending on peak. And, um, you know, and I manage directly manage a leadership team of, of about eight people that, that then, you know, manage everybody else. So when I started, it was me. Uh, it was it was Emily. She was my she was my unpaid intern, and then um, I had one painter that that had kind of rolled through with me from the college painting days, and uh, he he worked by himself hand brushing houses. His name was Terry. Uh, from there, I had to hire another paint crew, and we actually scaled up to two paint crews of about two to three people. So um, that I use the analogy of just you have to sift in this business. You have to sift through a lot of the junk, a lot of the crap to. Yeah to find the golden, you know, golden nuggets. And then when you do, you, you pay them really well, take good care of them and, and they'll be loyal. So, so we did that right away. Cause I can't paint well. Um, but the, the next person that I hired is my, my love and, and is generating leads, meeting with people and then sitting down and, and selling you something. Um, I'm, I'm great at that. So I needed to open up more time. So I hired a uh, production manager. So that was somebody that would oversee the job from scheduling to picking colors all the way through to happy customer that's uh, telling everybody about us. So that, I, that was my first official big, big hire. That makes perfect sense too, especially because if you're really great at sales, you need to continue on the sales side just in general. How did you yes. find the golden nuggets? Because that's what everybody wants and hiring people is tough sometimes. Yeah. I, I wasted a lot of time. So, I mean, in, in terms of hiring and recruiting, the best piece of advice I could give is I think in any business, I mean, you, you know, we were talking about 
some hiring and firing decisions you may have had to make, but um, you're going to get a lot of applicants. So it's, it's that funnel. You put out an ad, a post, whatever it is. And in painting, my, my typical interview day was go to Starbucks and set up eight interviews every hour. So I'm there from eight to four. I'm getting like super jacked up on coffee. Um, oh, yeah. half, half the guys show up, the other half of the half show up late. One of them, you know, so I spend all day um, to, to find one person, two people, bring them out on the job site to, to maybe find one that's even going to hang for like a month. So I, I started doing a group interview process where I said, hey, Thursday at two o'clock, uh, we're all meeting here. And, and I would set up systems for them to fail or select themselves out of, of what I needed. So if I need you to be on time and confirm an appointment, I would ask you in, in an email uh, before that, hey, confirm on Wednesday that you're going to be here. And then I would have everybody show up. And it's cool when people get in a in a, in a group scenario, I think you can see a little bit more of their uh, their true personality one on one. I can I can sell you and tell you whatever I want, you know, in, in the painting industry kind of a thing. So we started doing group interviews and just being very efficient with time and just creating systems to see what these guys and gals were made of and just be able to give them 20 opportunities to exit before it actually mattered. Um, so, so that gave me more time to do that. And we found some really quality people that way. Oh, that's so smart. Setting up the system. So that way you're not wasting your time and yeah. there, you know what I mean? And, and you don't have to feel bad about going, oh, you're great. And then, oh, wait, they didn't do this. And then they did. Cause that's what tends to happen. You hire someone, you're like, oh, they seem like they're pretty good. And then you maybe do a contract with them or something. And then you're like, oh, well then, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? And you feel like it's a yeah. huge waste of time. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And then another key thing is, you know, when, when you feel like you've got somebody that, that's going to work is uh, I run, you know, I run behavior and, and personality profiles on them. It shows, hey, here, here's the iceberg in the water. Here's the part of the iceberg. You can see how they're going to respond to people and problems and, and your systems. And, you know, here's the stuff that drives it from beneath the surface. So when I started learning about that and using that, I, I could really uh, plug somebody in knowing, say, a production manager needs to have A, B and C. Yeah as a, as a style, as a behavior pattern. And, and this person doesn't have that. That's great that you're nice. That's great that you like the position, but it's just, it's not a fit. So that was another huge thing that we did, um, in the early years and, uh, continue to, to do every day still to this day. How do you know though? Cause everybody messes up. So like I'll have a, yeah. a client and they just, you know, their first hire and then they're like, I don't know. Then they did this and then they did this. So there's yeah. things, especially when they're new, like things just come mm -hmm. up. How do you know when you're like, man, this is it. I'm going to pay them well. They're my main person versus not. I, I think an, an initial passion about, about the, the job and the culture and the community that they're joining into. I'm, I'm not huge in the first, second, even third meeting of saying, here's your job description, here's what it pays. And they're asking me, what is the job description? What does it pay? I, I, they give me the resume and I kind of throw it aside and they look at me like, you're not going to give me a, a bad resume. But for me, mm -hmm. just that, that personal connection, I, I shared the vision of the company. I said, here's where I came from. I'm, I'm dead broke. A uh, year and a half later, I'm, I'm broke even. And, and then, you know, a couple of years later is when you called me and we talked about doing this interview, like maybe six years ago. And so I'm just sharing the vision of we, we want to grow. We want to uh, give back to the community and serve. And, you know, how do you feel about that? Let's I mean, because if you get into you're, you're going to paint blue trim on this house tomorrow and it pays thirteen dollars an hour versus, yeah. you know, we're here to make an impact in the community and, and give back and, and serve people and, you know, paint people's homes for free that, that need it, that can't afford it. Um, and, and you get that connection and you see them get excited. Mm -hmm. I, I'd rather have that all day long and then train on the, on the tactical job description, assuming there's a, you know, personality fit. Okay. And that I think is what made a difference while I'm, I'm sitting next to the other painter, literally three chairs down and here comes a painter, here comes another guy late, you know, it's $12 an hour and they're, they're fighting about, you know, a dollar an hour. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's one of the unique things that we've done and it really works for us. So. So what I think is hilarious, though, is thinking about your wife and bringing her on the team. Because I've worked with a lot of married couples. And so yeah. tell me about what that was like, because that starts to be a sticky situation. And even if you have her run the personality profiles and stuff, what did that look like? And what advice do you have for people? My, my advice is uh, at least my experience. And this is just my experiences. I I think, you know, let, let your marriage be your marriage and let your work be your work. And when you start combining those things, I mean, I remember when we had the, the office phone, there was a caller ID on the television. So we're, we're watching our favorite episode of whatever. And then you see, you know, so-and-so customer call that, yeah. that was frustrating. But, um, the, the, the Mary dynamic, I'm a very, uh, you know, I attack and approach problems. I'm a people person. I'm very limbic. I just go out and, and I'll jump off the cliff, whether I have a parachute or not. 
and I know that somebody will be there to throw me a parachute and, that, and that's her. She's like, whoa, whoa, Matt, you need to slow down. Um, she doesn't like things changed on her very quickly. Uh, an example is I'd go out and I'd close business and, and pull in the money. But if I have to sit down and put it in the bank, it's going to go in the wrong bank account and it's, and it's not going to be balanced. So we actually balanced each other out very well. But I, I just think the strain of, you know, you're together all day. You've got, you've got your marriage. We're newlyweds. We've got debt and home and all this stuff going on. Um, talking about a, a family and children, and then you've got just the office coming in. For us, it, it didn't work, and she was she was really excited to to leave. Her goal's been to be a stay at home mom, and um, that was awesome. The day that she got to do that and, and bring somebody in to replace her. Okay, so that makes it, it way different than her going. Oh, now I have to find a job or something like that. She's like, oh, yeah. great, I get to stay home, and it that sounds like a great transition. I can only imagine what it's like though if you're married and you kind of have to have that conversation where she's not happy about, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. We can't work together. You know what and I mean? there were certain customers. I remember one customer and I said, Emily, I said, if I, if I talk to this customer, things aren't going to go well. You're, you're, you're just better suited than she was, but I don't want to talk to her either. So just, just think, just things like that. I mean, and she was, she was around for a lot of the initial frustrations and, um, you know, painting's a crazy business. We've had crazy things happen. And, um, for me, you know, I, I, I look at it and I say, Hey, it's business for her. A lot of stuff is, is very personal. Um, so, you know, when somebody would steal or blow up a job, she, that really impacted her. And I was just like, okay, you're fired next. Let's, you know, it's done. Um, so that uh, I would consider in a, in a relationship too, is you can't take business personal. And, and we had some relationships that, that were created and then broke apart because of that. And I think that impacted her more than, than it did me, but that's just, that's how she's wired. That's her style. But let's talk about that for a second, because that's something that's hard for people to go, oh, you stole from me, you're fired. Like, and we're done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. especially when you get in it and this is your baby and this is a thing and how yeah. could they? And then it starts to. So how how do you do that? How, how do I fire or deal with well, how that? How do you or? deal with issues in business that d and don't make it a th into a thing? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I remember, you know, the first time that I had to fire somebody just, just about, about anything. And it's, it's always tough. That's not a conversation you, you don't want to have, but, um, my, my style and, and especially now, and I've, and I've grown and, and matured a lot. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm going to, if you, if you're great and you believe in this company, I'm going to take awesome care of you. I'm going to give you a better opportunity than anybody else. And, and this is what I expect. And for me, there's a difference between, Hey, I made a mistake. Uh, my bookkeeper the other day thought she made a forty-seven thousand dollar deposit, but but she didn't. The the checks were just in in a little zipper bag somewhere, and it's fine. So we're going through. We found it. It, it was an honest mistake. No Thank no goodness. big deal. Um, yeah. that's not a big deal. But you know, if you're consistently intentionally uh, breaking a rule, if you there, there's absolutes like you don't you don't steal um, from from me. You steal from me. You steal from my family. Um, and again, and I'm that very direct style. I don't, I don't have a problem saying it and um, I'll say it right away and, and just handle it, but it's tough. It's always a hard conversation. We, uh, we had to let somebody go, um, this business, you can, um, th there's a stereotype, but it's kind of true that there's, you know, there's a lot of drugging and, and guys that'll get in and out of drugs and, and crime. And we had, we had that happen just a couple of weeks ago and it, and it wasn't pretty, but you know, I said, let's, let's handle this. And we did. Um, and it's nothing personal. The guy that we let go was very respectful. Um, but I've also had people get very not respectful and, and, you know, handle, handle that differently. But for me, I mean, the, the smile really turns off and it's just straight down to business, but that's my strength. That's, that's what I do. So it's a huge strength. Uh, what advice do you have yeah. for me? I'm a little too nice sometimes. Right. So I'm like, well, yeah. and then I think of their personal situation and I'm like, oh, I don't, you know what I mean? I feel yeah. responsible. They're employee. You know what I mean? That sort of thing. Yeah. So uh, how do I give me some tips on so how you, to be you have, mean? No, <laughs> like, you just have that feeling of just like the loyalty and the responsibility to the person. And you'll always put like their needs and their, their family or their situation before. I care before yours. a lot. Yeah. 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 And, and, th and that's a good thing. And I think your, your team members will, will see that is, I mean, I, I, either hire, hire somebody that, that has a style that just, you know, the Donald Trump style of like, Hey, you're fired that you can consult with, um, hire your alter ego, um, hmm. or, you know, you're just, you're going to approach it, approach it differently. I mean, I think your style would, you, you'd probably fire somebody smiling at them, um, and they would leave feeling good about it. Not, not even knowing that they just got fired and, you know, but they, but they I've didn't I've always do been job. friends with all the people that I, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. is, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. My mentor used to tell me just in general, like, like you need, what your business needs is very different than what you think you need. So put your hat yeah. on of the business and go, what does your right. business need and freaking fire them. And I'm just like, yeah. it's so, it's so easy to say and so hard to do. How the, is it just innate in you? 
Um, it went, and, and what I do now, especially with the, the mattshop.com is I go into companies and groups and churches and married couples and I, and I profile people and say, you know, you're either people are wired to either be more about a task and completing something, getting an experience done and completed. Some people lean more towards the people and the emotion and, and the feelings. And, uh, you have people that are conflict avoiders. I'm, I'm not a conflict avoider. If I'm in Walmart and, you know, I saw, saw a guy the other day being mean to like an old lady working at Walmart. So I, I yelled at him and I told him about it. And my wife's <laughs> like, I gotta go. So you just might not naturally have that, you know, yeah. head, head right into conflict kind of a thing. So you, you've got, again, our business has grown just cause we, we all stick to what we're good at. Um, I'm good at, you know, being direct, making choices, pulling triggers, um, but then having that balance, I have a, a guy, Kevin, on my team, and he's phenomenal. We literally are like the opposite charts and graphs. So when I get fired up about something and I'm like, you know, fi fire that guy or we we can't work for this customer, he goes, hold on, Matt. And he he thinks about everybody else. He thinks about the long term. Um, and then we usually meet, we, we balance each other out. So that's needed in a business. If you've got a whole bunch of, hey, let's go fire everybody styles. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're not going to have I mean, you're not going to have anybody left. That, that would be me. If there's a bunch of mats running around, I would have fired everybody like three times at some point. <laughs> that's the opposite. But what's so awesome is you said at the beginning, that's sort of what you and your wife did. And you found somebody, Kevin, yeah. that sort of has that same thing yep. and can sort of fill that role, which is what we need to have to have both sides. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love this. Okay. I know we have to start wrapping up, which sucks. I want to no. have you back on this. I know it goes by we'll do, really we'll quick. We'll do like part two. We'll do round two. It's totally fine. We definitely fine. will. And you have to send me the, the, the urinal cake, whatever <laughs> story things. Cause I'm going totally to find, find a picture and I, and I literally, I have to find a message cause it was drunk people at an old Chicago. <laughs> I hope I can share their name, but it was literally, it's like three in the morning. Hey man, I, I, I need some paint. I'm peeing or I'm peeing on you right now. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> I, I love this because some people like we talk about marketing tactics and they're like, I don't know, like what? A, and you're like making urinal cakes, you know what I mean? To test. I think that's yeah. like the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah. Try it. Try it. Track it. Test it. And you, you'd be surprised what might work. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. So the last question is, what's one action listeners can take this week to help move them forward towards their goal of a million? is uh, write it out and set a date for it. For me, I had a, uh, I had a specific date and we talked a little bit about this, but, but set it down, have it be part of a, a bigger vision. Um, be, you know, being a millionaire is really, really cool, but it's not as cool as I thought it would be. For me, the big thing was the, the impact we get to have giving back to the community and helping people with it. So for me, that, that drive of the million bucks or the, the, the net worth is here's the bigger picture behind it. So set a date and have a, a drive that's bigger than you behind it. And then just and then just get to work. I love that. And I have so many people that set a date and then they'll email me and tell me the date and go, I want to go on your show on this date, which I think is the coolest thing ever. I'll be like, sure, if you hit a million yeah. status, you come on my show. I'll be happy yep. to have you on, which is so awesome. And I'm so happy to have you on. So tell us where we can find more about you and actually what you do, because you definitely do the painting side. You still own that business, but you're doing yeah. something on your own. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So the painting, it, it pretty much runs itself. I still, I still jump in. I'm a little bit of a control freak and I'm, and I'm working on that. But uh, as, as that's going, I've just ventured into speaking and consulting. And as we've talked a little bit, um, what I do is basically profiling teams and people and individuals and going into a company, any group of humans working towards a common goal of anything and say, hey, here's how you're all going to act and behave in this situation. Here's why. Here's what you guys need to do, how you need to communicate. Um, and I go in and do workshops and coaching purely based on on what we've been talking about with these styles. And, and that can all be found at uh, mattshalp.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on today. I Thanks. really appreciate Thank it. You, so glad we did it. Take care. Thanks. See ya. I hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want more like it, go to eventualmillionaire.com. If you click on the millionaire case studies, you will see over 200 millionaire interviews. I don't want you to get overwhelmed, of course, but I do want you to pick the one that might make the biggest difference in your business today. So what's something you're struggling with and take a look and see if one of those could specifically help you. Don't just take information for information's sake. I want you to be able to take the information, have it applicable to you right now. You use it, you take action, you see results, you come back and go, Jamie, that was amazing. That's what I want. So go check out eventualmillionaire.com and click on the millionaire case studies. Thanks.